tasting kitchen is what mom called it and I just thought it was huge and it was so much fun to come play outside. There was a wonderful cedar post fence. Daycare for my parents, if they had to do something, my grandmother would take me up to the New Braunfels from San Antonio and she'd check on her restaurant, we'd go swing by the plant. I was just fascinated, of course, when you're a kid walking around the equipment and the big freezers. School started at 9, so I got up about 8.45 and could make it to school and then I still had a long lunch hour so I'd go down to the restaurant work for about an hour or so and then go back to school and finish out the day. It was the ultimate playground. I loved coming down here as a kid. I was going into my sophomore year and Mike was in between his sophomore and junior year but that's basically when we started at the restaurant and did that all the way through college. Many people don't realize that we are very much about the mail order business. Many people do only know about the restaurant and I have to tell them, no, I don't work at the restaurant, I work at the plant. And they don't quite often realize that there is a plant here. My name is Sue Dunbar Snyder. My mom and dad started the smokehouse, so Dudley and I now are the owners. Sue and I married in 1968 and after a tour with the Air Force, as a navigator, I joined the family business in 1973. My father was born in Garden City, Texas, which is in West Texas, close to Big Spring. My mother was born in Kaufman, Texas, in East Texas. But they met in Dallas when he was working for an investment bond business and lived in Dallas. And she was its secretary. And so they fell in love and married. I think the first business that they had in New Braunfels was a beer distributorship. That led to the purchase of the ice company. The ice business was where they had the public lockers and that led to the smoking of the meats because they had this man working for them that had all these old German recipes. At that time, you know, most people didn't have home freezers so you had to rent cold storage space if you wanted to store, say you had a calf butchered or something like that, you had to have some place to, to store that, so where they rented lockers. Mike Dieter, I'm the Vice President and General Manager in New Braunfels Smokehouse. I started when I was actually 16 years old, March 1966. This building has had a really colorful history. It, it was actually built in, I believe, 1916, originally as the New Braunfels Brewing Company, and uh, they made Busto beer, uh, which uh, they sold here locally, and of course it was very successful until the you know, wonderful thing called Prohibition came along and uh, you couldn't do that anymore. Of course, the, the Germans didn't take too kindly to that, so they, they said, okay, we'll make near beer and we'll get by with that. The slogan for this Busto brand of beer was, we don't have beer near here, but we have near beer here. Near beer just kept getting a little stronger and a little stronger and Eventually they uh, got raided by the revenuers and, and they came in and shut the operation down. The smokehouse came about with a man, a good friend of my dad's, and a golfing buddy, Bill Wyatt, who had an advertising agency in San Antonio. And he had heard Kim talking about the, the smokehouse and what was going on at the plant and heard stories of the great smoked bacon and the good turkeys and hams. Right as World War II was you know, coming about, and they were still in the ice business and they were in the cold storage business. And so Bill Wyatt said, well, why in the world don't you share that with Texas? And so they put together a small brochure and sent it just within Texas. And that's really the beginning of the smokehouse. A lot of people think it was the restaurant first and then the, then the mail order, but it was the other way around. When I first started with it, we were still using, and I'm sure a lot of people won't even know what I'm talking about, but they actually called them a dressograph plates. And there were actually 10 plates that had a name and address embossed on them with a imprinting machine. And you had to file each one of those into little file cabinets like you would do card files. And that's how you maintained your mailing list. And then when the post office sent you back an address correction, you actually had to go physically pull that card and look at it, compare the two, and say, okay, this isn't the correct address. Then you had to make a new plate. Sue's parents, uh, Kim and Arabelle, were a great team together. Uh, she being the, the food person, and he being the uh, businessman behind the food operation. They started it, of course, together, but with this idea about the mail order. And then Mom said, well, if people can't taste the product, they're not going to want to order it. So why don't we put in a little store on the highway between San Antonio and Austin so that travelers can stop in. Just kind of a sampling the meats, 
buy it and take it with you on the road. Start out very simply and have a store and if they want to buy something and take it with them, great, or if they want to just pick up a brochure. Originally, we had uh, three two-truck uh, Chicago-style houses that uh, were fired down in the basement. Our recipes have all been based on the hickory uh, smoking process. We don't use any liquid smoker, paint the sausage so it's brown or anything. It's, it's all naturally done with hickory. We have experimented with the mesquite concept. We've experimented with the oak concept, but still the mildest one and the easiest one to use on a day-to-day -day basis with the smoke generators and things like this is hickory. You can go back and, and look at the USDA recipes that, that have been in those files since the 60s when they were originally developed, and they're the same recipes that we've been using at this plant since then. They haven't changed. They were ones that originally laid down when the plant started smoking meats, so they're still in use. One of our longest running products that we've ever produced is, is uh, what we call our Bismarckian sausage. It uh, was a recipe that was developed by Ben O'Sheenaman, who was one of our very first smoke masters. He actually sold that recipe to Mr. Dunbar because Mr. Dunbar wouldn't have it any other way that he had to pay for that recipe. And we still use that same recipe today. It took off. I mean, people loved it. They loved our smoked meats. We loved her homemade recipes. And, and she collected recipes from all the wonderful cooks that had worked for us through the years. It evolved into a small restaurant and then it turned into a big restaurant. And our mail order was always on the side, growing and growing and growing. And in 19, I think it was 68, mm -hmm. they picked up the, the building that was directly across the street so they'd have more room and it was a gorgeous property. Of course at that time there was a swimming pool and, and of course after you work a hot day in a kitchen or something, at night it was a nice time to just take a splash in a restaurant swimming pool. Yep, we had a swimming pool. That was always real nice and handy. One day Mrs. Dunbar uh, drove up, I guess, and there were uh, a couple of real nice looking young waitresses that we had working for us out there, and they were sitting on the poolside getting a little amorous with one of the other employees. Ms. Dunbar saw that and she said, nope, I'm not going to put up with that. I don't want that going on on my piece of property. So the pool was history after that. In those days, our production facilities were very limited, our smokers were very antiquated, and our shipping uh, space was small and congested. Mike and I knew that if we tried to double our business in a year, we were asking for trouble. Plus, we were pretty conservative business-wise, and we just kind of grew it little by little. If we did about 120 or 150,000 pounds of meat, it was a good year. Now, if we don't do that in a week, we're, it's not a good week. It has grown tremendously. When Mom died, Mike and Dudley and I were thrown into the, the heat of the business. And our greatest contribution is that we listen to each other. Every decision we make, we confer with one another. And somehow, you know, most of our decisions end up being the right one after we've had a chance to, to talk about them. It's been a wonderful team that I'm, I'm really proud to be a part of. It always looks rosy on the outside, but I mean, it's, it's, it's always a, a tough thing trying to get all this brought about. When we went from the ice business, everybody kind of thought, oh, you're, you're nuts for getting out of that. You, you're making a profit at that. The first year out, we, we proved that wrong. We made more profit in the other part of the business than we did made in that business. Through 98 or 99, when I moved here, there was so much e-commerce and the technology boom of the 90s really made sense for us to get involved with the web business. As luck would have it, my son wasn't real crazy about being out of New Braunfels. Sue and Dudley, I guess, realized that I was getting older and at the same time my business was growing and there were more demands, I decided to get an understudy in and of course their son was, was wanting to get involved in the business also, so that all just kind of naturally progressed. Getting back to my hometown was a, a big deal to me. Actually, my dad mentioned it to me at an A&M football game. He goes, you know, Sue and Dudley are asking if you want to come back. And I was like, really? And it was kind of a cool feeling to know that they wanted me to come back. It was already set up, you know, for our mail order business, so let's get a really solid website started, which Brandon and I kind of tinkered with. It's been a real godsend because Brandon has taken on the, the IT part of the business 
and he deals in stuff that I have no clue what he's dealing with. I just say, get it done. In 1997, which would have been the first year we sold anything online, and it wasn't even through a shopping cart, it was through an email, I think our sales were $376. So it was like a couple of orders. It took a little convincing of the older generation to understand there's a real potential here in the web. Now, you know, on a busy day during season, we'll take 1,200 to 1,500 orders online in one day. It's almost two different plants around holiday time. We go from a five or six day week to seven days. It's amazing how much product goes through this plant. There's really not a time of day where there is not something going on at this facility. Come October, you won't be able to see that back wall over there. We'll actually stack the whole aisle full, three, three high. This room right here holds 800 pallets in the racks and is at negative 10. This is where we do all our long-term storage. We have to plan where things are in the freezer because it could take weeks to get to it. Essentially, we play meat Tetris. I can't tell you how many people say, well, I love your chicken and dumplings or your bread pudding or your turkey and bacon salad. Would you, why don't you write a cookbook and put all your recipes in it? And I thought, oh, well, I just, I'm not, I've never done a, a book. I can't do a book. But I thought, well, maybe I'll put together something for my children and my grandchildren. I'll just write a few of the smokehouse recipes down or some of my mom's recipes and maybe get the grandkids to illustrate it. And so that's the way it started. And eight years after I had that first idea, I had a phenomenal woman uh, from Houston, Connie Moverly, who encouraged me to do a different looking cookbook than what I had envisioned. You know, I've been collecting recipes and, and testing them for many years and lots of flops and Dudley had to put up with all the, the goods and the bads of the recipe collection. Chief guinea pig. We tested all these recipes and finally came down to a core group. And then I found this phenomenal artist from Fredericksburg, Texas, who hand illustrated the drawings, the illustrations, and so after eight years it finally came about in um, 2007. For me, I can't tell you how great it makes you feel when you have someone that comes up to you and says, oh, I made your cranberry salad last night for dinner or it's for Thanksgiving. Oh, everybody loved it. So people are using it. You know, it's one thing to buy a cookbook because they're my friends, but it's another thing to tell you, to have them come up to you and say, oh, that's my very favorite soup. I'm so glad you have it in your cookbook. So it's been, a, it was a wonderful experience. You know, I've, I've been here 47 years. We have, I think, three or four employees that are that are pushing right at 40 years that have worked with me and, and for me all, all that time. I started at the restaurant in 1965. Plant manager kind of evolved. I think it was a kind of a joint decision between Mr. Dunbar and Mike Dieter, my best friend. Rocky was hired before I was and, and we were best friends and so he just kind of uh, said hey I got we got some openings and being the country boy that I was it was in the air conditioning I said hey that's a pretty good deal I think I can handle this you know working there and getting paid to do it and being cool at the same time so the rest is history as they say. Yeah, it's a family I mean it's just how we run things. Rocky has been nothing but great to me from day one when I came in here. I mean it has just been wonderful working for Rocky. It's the lifestyle. We don't want to get to that large corporate sized where we have a board of directors coming in from let's just say non-locally and telling us what to do. We're pretty confident that we can make decisions based upon our own common sense here and experience that are going to work out well. Of course I couldn't do any of the stuff I do if I didn't have those dedicated employees that are, that are backing me up. Mike is Mr. Frugal. <laughs> and he doesn't let us step too far out of, out of line. We always tell him that he's way too hard on us, but it, it keeps us all in line. And I think people in New Braunfels really think that the Dieterts own the smokehouse, and that's always been fine with us because it's wonderful that they take that much of an interest in the business to have people think it's their own. So you can't ask for anything more than that.